Mary, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I can't wait to meet myself. This is not very exciting. Um, one thing you missed out, though, and I think we have to get these kind of uh, league tables in proportion, and I've, I felt I should mention it, was uh, another thing where I scored quite well was most inspirational women. And uh, I came in as number 14, and my mum was very proud of this, not least because uh, Camilla Parker Bowles, as she was then, the now Duchess of um, Cornwall, she came in at number 30, so mum thought this was it. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the whole thing was put in perspective because coming in much higher than me at number nine, I was number 14, was Dolly Parton. So I think, I think one can't get to, um, as the Australians would say, up oneself about these kind of accolades. But thank you so much nonetheless. Um, so as you heard, I'm here um, wearing unashamedly the hat of the neuroscientist. And what I thought I'd do is talk roughly in three different parts. I'm assuming that although there are some medics and psychologists here, that the vast majority of you are not card-carrying neuroscientists. Is that right? Yeah. So what we'll do is have the fastest ever course in neuroscience um, for the first part of the talk. And then um, how, given this newly acquired knowledge that you'll have by then of the brain and the mind, how we can evaluate some of the issues that the digital technologies are posing. Um, and because that will be quite gloomy, please don't get depressed because the third part is going to be um, some ideas about what we can do about it. So that's roughly um, the overview. And uh, what's wonderful about being here is having now this platform with so many people here um, to feel that we are all, I think, thinking in the same way. And here's Meryl Streep, of course, um, saying the greatest gift of human beings is that we have the power of empathy. And one of the questions that the media asked me just now was, why is it important? Why, why should it be such a big deal? Well, just imagine a world without it. Imagine not having empathy. Um, and I think, really, we don't have to argue the case, especially here, as to why this is central to human civilization, humankind, and our well-being. So let's start, then, by thinking about what it means to be human and why it's so important that we do empathize with each other. What do we mean when we talk about humans? Well, we occupy more ecological niches than any other species on the planet. And it's not because we run fast, we don't see particularly well, we're not particularly strong compared to many others in the animal kingdom, but we do something superlatively. Other animals do it to greater or lesser extent. The goldfish doesn't do it very well, and that is adapt to the environment. Now, the poor old goldfish, uh, let's be brutal, they don't have great personalities, do they? Yeah. And, and if you had a goldfish and um, it died while your kids were at school, you could sneak off and get another goldfish. And uh, perhaps you've done this, you know, and they, they wouldn't know any difference. Whereas you couldn't do that with uh, pet cats or dogs. And much as they might want you to, you certainly couldn't do it with their brothers or sisters. And that is because as we progress in evolution, so we escape increasingly the tyranny of genes, we escape the tyranny of instincts, such as characterizes the repertoire of the goldfish, and you become more and more interactive and vulnerable and at the same time sensitive to the power of the environment. And as a human beings do this superlatively more than any other species, we adapt to the environment. So you probably don't recognize me in this picture, but there I am in the middle. And I'm sure you could show similar pictures. What shaped you? What made you so different from everyone else? It's not your heart or your lungs or your liver. What is it about humans that means that we are so individual? We have these individual experiences that make us individuals. So even if you're a clone, that's to say an identical twin, you are unique. And no one will ever be like you ever again. No one will have a mind like yours, a consciousness like yours ever again. And for the 100,000 years we've stalked this planet, there's never been anyone like you, nor will there ever be again. And I put it to you, it's that that we have to preserve. That's what matters to human beings. It's their identity and their uniqueness that makes them so special. So how do we, therefore, go from that to this. Now, sorry if you've just had breakfast and this puts you off, but um, I'm afraid if you ask a neuroscientist to speak, this is what happens. They show you a picture. Sooner or later, they show you a picture of the brain. And the reason I like this picture is because it takes me back um, a long time ago now from when I was an undergraduate at Oxford, and we had to dissect a human brain. I know there's some medics here, so I'm sure you've had a similar experience. Um, because the brains come in plastic buckets, um, and they're immersed in formalin, which is a fixative that obviously preserves them, which is toxic and pungent. You're wearing surgical gloves, as in this picture. I remember the first day this happened, and they brought in these sort of Tupperware buckets, you know, and you roll your sleeves up. Can you imagine this? And uh, you're wearing gloves, but you plunge your hand in, and then you just hold this brain in one hand. 
just like this, a bit like something out of Hamlet, actually. You, you hold this, you know, you, you hold it just in one hand, and you think that's the essence of a person. You know, and how do you get from the amazing impossibility of trying to understand, as we've just heard, you know, what makes a person? How, do, how does it boil down to this, this thing that I could get under my fingernails? Because yeah? I was thinking, if I wasn't wearing gloves um, and a bit dislodged under my fingernail, would that be the, the bit that somebody loved with? You know, can you have an emotion under your fingernail? Yeah? Or could you have a memory under your fingernail, going to the seaside with Auntie Flo under your fingernail? No. Or could you have a habit like biting your fingernail under your fingernail? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, no, seriously, this is what keeps us awake at night, we neuroscientists. <laughs> yeah, it's a big issue, yeah? Because um, that's all you've got, to, and it's very uncooperative, the brain. There's no, any, there's no, it's not like the heart or the lungs, there's no, it's not mechanical, there's no clear moving parts about it. And yet, somehow, the challenge is to say, how do we get from that to this, this rich diversity that we pride ourselves on, that we are, that, if you like, that we would call the mind. And I like to distinguish the brain from the mind. Some philosophers um, look down on people such as myself. They think we deal in the squalor of the chemistry of the brain, and they're dealing with the aloof, airy, fairy things of the mind. Um, what I want to show you is that that's a misconception, and that we... We neuroscientists, with our squalid chemistry, nonetheless can aspire to thinking about the mind, but we relate it to the physical brain, and I'll show you how I think we can do that. So how do we develop a mind? Well, um, forgive, forgive me, the, the technical people that are here, I'm going to talk in lay terms. The blobby bits, known to the specialist as neurons, uh, or brain cells, and you can see here, when you're first born, you have a fair complement of the blobby bits, namely brain cells, but very rapidly, as the brain grows postnatally, the growth of the brain is caused by the proliferation, not of the blobby bits of the brain cells, but of the connections between them. And if you remember anything, remember that. It is these connections that are all important. Why? Because even if you're a clone, that is to say an identical twin with the same genes, you are going to have nonetheless a unique configuration of brain cell connections. Because, because you're human and not a goldfish, these connections are going to be forged and strengthened and updated and constantly uh, regulated by your personal interaction with the environment that no one else shares or has. This is something called plasticity. It doesn't mean to say that the brain is made of plastic, of course, it comes from the Greek plastikos, to be molded. So this is the essence I'm going to persuade you. These connections are all important, and we know that plasticity operates throughout life. For example, in this um, series of paintings by a gentleman who had a stroke, and it was a stroke characterized by neglect of half his body. And he was an artist, and when he was asked to paint um, himself, he only painted half a face because that's all he recognized as his. But within nine months, you can see by the time we get to bottom right, he's painting himself fully again. And I'm sure you're familiar and perhaps know personally people who've had strokes and had partial recovery or complete functional recovery following a stroke. That's plasticity at work. It's the brain working hard to compensate for what's been damaged, so as well as during development. Um, but it's, you don't have to have a stroke for plasticity to be at work. Your everyday life, even as an adult, can leave its mark literally on your brain. And this is a wonderful example um, of London taxi drivers. It's a very famous study, this. It was done a while ago. But uh, it's a classic, and you'll see why because of this. Now, those of you who've been to London uh, will think that this is probably a very unusual picture um, because the cab driver is actually smiling which um, they never do, yeah. especially if you mention the words Boris Johnson or Brexit, you'll find that um, you, know, you don't have to keep up your end of the conversation very much. They'll do all the talking. Um, it's, it's also um, quite unusual because the passenger is smiling, so clearly this was a faked, fake picture. But anyway, so the reason, I, the reason I'm showing you these are the black cab drivers. I don't know about here in uh, Toronto, but um, in, uh, in England, for a black cab, they have to pass a test called the knowledge where for about two years they have to learn by heart all the streets of London, all the one-way systems, so that without recourse to a manual, um, when they come to have their oral exam, it's a very punishing exam, the examiner says, how would you take me from A to B? And they have to recite off every single street, every um, one direction and so on. I don't know, what are um, Toronto taxi drivers like now? They'd be the control group probably, would they? Uh, they'd be the control, okay, so well, certainly in Melbourne, if ever you go there, they would certainly be the control group. It's, uh, anyway, um, so in this ingenious study, what they did was to scan the brains of London taxi drivers because they had this phenomenal memory that they had learned. And lo and behold, they found that an area of the brain called the hippocampus, shown here, 
And you can see the back of the brain is that orange cauliflowery thing, and the front of the brain is on the left. Um, what they found that the hippocampus was actually bigger in London taxi drivers than in people of the same age. And it wasn't having um, a big hippocampus that predisposed you to being a London taxi driver because the difference was more marked for the longer that they had been driving. Now, this fact is not lost on the London taxi drivers. If you can get a word in edgeways over Brexit, if you're ever in London and take a black cab, ask them if they know what the hippocampus is, and they all do. They all, they're very proud of this. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an example of the more you use something, the more it will prosper and strengthen. And this example of plasticity of how people of all ages adapt to the environment is now there's lots of examples. So we can look at various studies on experts, such as London taxi drivers. Uh, you can see musicians, mathematicians, uh, basketball players. So it can be both mental and physical activities, prowess, that will leave its mark literally on your brain. Golfers, um, I don't know if anyone plays golf, but uh, you can see if gratifying for them, they have larger grey matter volumes in certain areas. Now, you don't just have to be an expert, you can be a normal person. That's not to say, of course, that golfers aren't normal, but I'm sure in that regard, they're otherwise normal. Um, and so, as well as studying people that have sustained activity that has caused physical changes in their brain, you can also look at people like you and I, who are recruited to do experiments and then asked to do something like juggling, for reasons that defeat me. But anyway, you can then see that even within seven days, you see structural changes in the brain when you ask people to learn certain tasks. Similarly, exam preparation and learning a language all lead to physical and measurable peer review paper uh, reports of changes. So I don't have to labour the point. I think people are very familiar now with the notion of plasticity. And suffice it to say that um, for human beings, it's your evolutionary birthright that you will adapt to the environment and whatever you do. And it all happens by the connection between one brain cell and another, the so-called synapse. I'm sure everyone has heard of that. And the little chemical messengers that are released from one cell onto another across this gap that causes everything that you are. And it all happens, therefore, through the connections between your brain cells. OK, so if that's the case, how does it really work? Now, in order to understand that, we have to leave taxi drivers and golf players and, for a moment, uh, look at rats. And we have to do that because we're now going to de delve deep into the brain and look at physical changes at the level of brain cell connections. Um, now, you can't ask a rat to play golf or um, drive a cab, or obviously you can, but not going to get you far. So what you have to do is manipulate the environment of the rat to see if you can um, manipulate corresponding changes. And this uh, experiment is actually from my own lab, this picture I'm about to show you, because my graduate students had a lovely time contriving what's called an enriched environment. Now, enrichment for a rat doesn't mean to say they come to the Globe and Mail Center and have hopefully interactive, exciting, um, stimulating session. This is the equivalent for a rat of what you're doing now. Here we are, there they are, having a lovely time. Um, so uh, my graduate students built this environment for the rat where they're highly interactive creatures, as you can see, look how happy they look, because they know they're not in the control group. They probably have a, they've, 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 got, they've, got the, they've, they've drawn the long straw, as it were, yeah, compared to their counterparts in the ordinary old home cages. And what you can do, it's about three weeks only, you keep the rats in this kind of rat heaven, um, and then you compare it with rats who weren't quite so lucky in being allocated into groups who were in the ordinary, humane, but somewhat under-stimulated uh, home cages. And then you can look at a single brain cell from each animal in a way that you wouldn't in humans. And what I'm going to show you now is just that. So here you can see a single brain cell um, from an animal in the so-called standard environment. And this may be unfamiliar to you, but I'd like you to focus on the branches coming out of the blobby bit. The blobby bit is the main part of the cell, but I want you to draw your attention and concentrate on the branches and compare it with a brain cell from an animal from the enriched group. And you can see, I hope, that there is a difference. So even after three weeks, even for a rat, um, putting them in an environment with little um, wheels and chains or whatever they had, swings and so on, and interacting with each other, you can see the difference. Now, why is this interesting or important? Well, just as with muscle, I'm sure you are familiar with the notion of use it or lose it. And the more you exercise muscle, uh, the stronger and more effective it becomes. And if for some reason you can't use your muscle, like when my brother broke his ankle, we were astonished at how quickly his calf muscle atrophied because it wasn't being used. So you use it or lose it. And it's similar with brain cells. The more you make brain cells work hard, the more they will respond. But they don't just grow. What they grow are these branches. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, by growing branches, you are increasing the surface area of the cell. 
And by increasing the surface area physically and literally, you are now providing more space to facilitate more connections because now more brain cells can hook up with you because there's more target, there's more space to do that. So just to repeat, a stimulating interactive environment, whether it's taxi drivers or golfers, or rats in a stimulated, enriched environment, if you are making the brain work in a certain way and stimulating it, it will respond by growing more branches, which in turn will enable it to make more connections. Why is that important? Let's go back to humans. I want to suggest to you that connections in the brain give an ever deeper meaning over time. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's think of something like this. When you're a small baby, if you're shown this or an infant, it won't mean anything. This object won't mean anything, but it may be attractive because it's golden shiny. You might want to roll it. You might try and put it in your mouth. It could have an appeal because of its sensory properties alone. But as the weeks turn to months, gradually, because you're a human, you will obey your evolutionary mandate and you will develop connections that are reflecting the experience with this object. So you will learn, because that's what human beings do, you will learn this is something that goes on fingers. You might learn the name eventually. It's a ring. And you might then learn, as you uh, continue, that a gold shiny ring only goes on a certain finger, and it only goes on a certain finger under certain circumstances. So you will learn that if you see someone with one of these, it says something about the person. It means something that is not at all apparent from the sensory properties alone. OK, then you might acquire one of your own when you've grown up. And now this might be the most important thing to you, irrespective of its monetary value or the fact it's pretty generic in its appearance, that particular object might be the most important thing to you. And then sadly, as can happen, it might go from the honeymoon to the divorce, and now it's the thing that evokes the most bitter memories, the most negative thoughts, the most complex associations. And all of this from an object a kid would just put in its mouth. What has changed? Not the object, but the connections up here. What has happened is you've been liberated from evaluating the world in purely sensory terms to what we call cognitive, from the Latin cogito, I think. So now, as you are developing as a human being, you are shifting to evaluating people and objects and events in terms of their cognitive um, sense, not raw sensation. It's now the cognitive um, importance that you're putting on it. You are allocating a personalized meaning that is not apparent from the objects alone. Now, there's also another way in which connections can help you. In case you don't recognize this, this is a ghost. British ghost, that's what we all look like. Yeah. It's bad hair day is what we wear when we're wearing these. Yeah. Um, now, had I come on dressed like this today, I don't think anyone here, I hope no one here would have been particularly frightened. You might have had other reactions and thoughts, but you certainly wouldn't have been frightened. Whereas a small child would be frightened. And indeed, someone with dementia also would be frightened. And that's incidentally what my company's on. And if I won't talk about it now, but if you want to contact me and talk about our research on dementia, I'd be delighted to do so. Now, just as we've seen, as you are developing, you are curating these wonderful connections that are personalized to you, that give you a personalized meaning on the world. So sadly, with dementia, you are going in a reverse direction. And the patient with dementia gradually as they are dismantled, as those connections dismantled, so slowly the world means less and less. And slowly they change to being more and more like a child and then an infant, where you are forced to evaluate the world by the sensory input alone. And you don't have the advantage, as we all do, of the checks and balances provided by the cognitive um, basis, the cognitive connectivity, the conceptual framework that you've been curating over your life. So someone with dementia very sadly becomes like a small child again. And in both cases, if all you've got is the senses and you don't have any checks and balances and something such as this um, is novel, of course it is potentially life-threatening and of course you'll be frightened by it. So that is why sadly um, we fear dementia because what you are losing is the essence of your individuality. You are literally using your mind dementia. Um, so it shows you how connections are important, not because they enable your own personal evaluation of the world, but they free you up from literally taking things at face value. They free you up from that so that you can have your own personal view of what is going on. And that is why I am um, very skeptical when people talk about computers, because in a sense, we need to be mindful of the difference between so-called fluid versus crystalline intelligence. As you can see here, rather depressingly, this fluid intelligence, so-called, peaks when we are very young and is on the decline. 
Now, fluid intelligence is rather like that of a computer, that is to say, to give the right responses to answers. Whereas, as you mature, and you know reassuringly, unless you are the victim of Alzheimer's disease or some other disease, and it is a disease of older age, it's not a natural consequence of aging. If you mature normally, then the more uh, you age, so you have more and more of an intensive conceptual framework, which means your understanding becomes deeper and deeper, hence wisdom. And that is what we would call um, knowledge. So you can see that there's automatically a difference between what one might think of um, as uh, mere mere information processing versus deeper understanding and knowledge. I think that's emphasized very nicely when uh, they try to get a computer to translate metaphors, and I just thought I'd sidetrack on this. So if you ask um, the computer to translate, or what does it mean, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, the computer comes up with, the vodka is good but the steak is lousy. <laughs> okay, it's taken it literally, you see. And there's inability to, to appreciate metaphors. Or here, out of sight, out of mind is invisible insanity. <laughs> so you can see now why um, there's many fears of AI, um, but, I'm, but very few of the fears are raised by neuroscientists, usually by um, people of the physical sciences or very rich billionaires like Elon Musk. It's never neuroscientists who fear this because we know there is a huge difference. And indeed, there's something called the Turing test, developed by the great Alan Turing, where the test would be, um, if you were given impartial access to a person and a computer and you could ask any question you liked and you received answers in a form that didn't tell you which was which, a computer would be deemed to be conscious, would be deemed to have passed the Turing test if you couldn't distinguish between the computer and the person. And as yet, there is no artificial device or computer or robot that has passed the Turing test. Very amusingly, though, there is, however, um, one or two human beings that have failed it. I'm sure you all know. You may know people like that, yeah. Um, so here we have this poor robot here trying to become a human. Okay, so um, the issue is then with facts that that is not the same as understanding. And you may be familiar with Charles Dickens and Thomas Gragram. What I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted. Um, I'd like to say that the, what connections do is enable you to escape from facts. Facts on their own are very boring. And what we want to do is, if you have information, you want to join up the dots so that you have knowledge. So that is part of what humans do. We're exploring what humans do, and that robots, to the best of my knowledge, fail to do. And I have no optimism while they'll ever achieve it. Moreover, we can escape just mere computational processing as you can see here, as well as our central nervous system, that is hooked up to our immune system and the endocrine system, all of which contributes to giving you the consciousness and the views you are. There's a lovely quote from Niels Bohr, the physicist, in the 1920s. He said to a student, you're not thinking, you're just being logical, which I think is what people forget. It's a nice quote. Yeah. Um, you might wonder what this has to do with empathy, but I'm trying to explore first in this fast course in neuroscience why the human brain is special and different and why we do different from computers. And then echoing Einstein about knowledge. Information is not knowledge. The only source of knowledge is experience. That is to say, living your life, having your brain cells stimulated and joining up the dots in such a way that you see the world in a unique way. Okay, so here you are living your life. This is downtown Oxford. That's how people think we all live, I think, still, yeah? And everyone in this picture is like everyone in this room. We all, although we're in the present, your current present is informed by your past. And as I'm talking, I bet everyone here has a unique and very different interpretation and reaction to what I'm saying and doing right now. So although you are in the present, it's a kind of extended present that is informed by the past and is probably planning the future or will inform your future. And it's this beginning, middle, and end, which I'm going to come back to again and again, because I think that sequence of a beginning, a middle, and an end is very important about being an adult human being, because it's this beginning, a middle, and end that echoes in a story. It's your life story. Let's hope the end is way into the future. Um, and I'm going to argue it's the essence of thought that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But that more and on. Suffice it to say that your identity, your identity is this, it's your unique passage in time and space going in one direction. And the more you are living your life, the more it is informing your present and the more it's making you unique. The more experiences you have, the more individual experiences you have, the more individual you become. And that's what I think makes you the special person you are. And it's all down to the connections in your brain cells to which you have about 100,000 connections on any one cell. So in answer to the philosophers who sneer at people like me, 
I would like to say that the biological basis of the mind is the personalization of the physical brain, it's, so you can distinguish it, but through the unique dynamic configurations of the neuronal connections that are in turn driven by your unique experiences. Okay, so that's the end of the course. That's now you're now, as neuroscientists now, hopefully you're armed to now explore the next possibility, which is what is the impact of this new world? If you accept that yes, that we are intimately in dialogue all the time with the environment, but it's not just that we are environment and processing um, as though it's not making any difference to us what's going on. Every time you're interacting with the environment, it is shaping and changing you. And it's this constant dialogue that is so fascinating and has so much potential, but so much uh, problems attached to it, especially when we think about this new era. So let's think about this new era. And I think that's summed up very well by comparing the election of the Pope here in 2005 to 2013. Look at the difference. Yeah, even within just eight years, you can see the difference in the number of cell phones, mobiles as we call them in the UK. Um, and then, you know, you can think about uh, what you see every day, which are these kind of things. Um, I'm showing these commonplace pictures to you simply because they are commonplace. Um, in 1999, would we, have, would we have seen pictures like this or thought about this? Now it's a way of life. I'm particularly interested by bottom right, which was a, a phase a while ago, I don't know if it's still done, called planking. Yeah, and what you do is you spend your time on this planet by lying flat in a line and looking at other people doing that on YouTube. And that's how people think that's... So I'd, I'd love to know why that is interesting you know, to do, but um, I, I think it's endemic you know, of where we are in society. So I don't think I need to argue too long or hard that the 21st century environment is unprecedented by just merely showing these pictures. Now, a particular relevance here is that we in this room are all what would be called digital immigrants. That's to say, we have already, because we are of sufficient stage in our life, although I appreciate some people are younger or older than others, nonetheless, we've all led lives with real memories, real friends, real experiences, so that, to a greater or a lesser extent, we'll embrace the digital world, but it will always be to embellish our real world. Whereas nowadays, um, for a child born now, you have this kind of thing. Um, so if you want to spend uh, 1,500 pounds, you can on a, here you are, a cot with a screen in it. Um, or here, um, as you may be aware, the American Pediatric Academy have said no child should have screen exposure under the age of two. Here, I think parents think the kid looks clever by playing with a screen like that. Um, perhaps most alarming of all is this, if you have shares in Fisher-Price. Yeah. Um, so from the very start, you have these very immature brains. Leave aside the cognitive impact and the deprivation of real interaction, but simply having to cope with an excessive amount of blue light, which for the immature visual system is a real strain. So even leaving aside that. And then this, um, this is, in case you needed to buy a present for someone, this is a bed for your phone. Okay? Just to say, it's as though your phone is a person, and you know you put your phone to bed, you know, because it's so important to you. Otherwise, it's the only way you can get the kid. Yeah, I mean, it would be funny if um, if it wasn't so sad. Um, and routine in the press now, we can see here in the Daily Telegraph last August, um, endless statistics. What was this one? Yeah, a fifth of 16 to 25 spend more than seven hours a day online. Um, the government imposing screen limits. Um, I think now there's a wake-up call. When I first wrote Mind Change in 2014 and preceding that when I've been talking about it for the previous five years, I got a lot of pushback and hostility, and now I feel very sadly vindicated because there are endless stories and reports and thoughts about this, so we don't have to go into it too much. Now, some might say, and they did, that I should be joining the Amish. I hope there's no Amish here. Um, but you know, there's always people like me that have stopped technology. Um, there was the Luddites, I'm sure you're familiar with the movement in the UK and the Industrial Revolution, who wanted to smash up the machines because they didn't like technology. So is it technophobia that I'm suggesting, or are we living, as I would suggest, in an unprecedented world? Let's just think about it. People do cite the printing press, or the car, or the television, and saying, look, these are all technological advances, and people shook their heads and um, clucked their, their tongue and you know, were um, disparaging about those things, and yet they enriched our lives. That's precisely the point. These inventions enriched the real life. Um, but those inventions didn't stop people eating together, which they always did, shopping face-to-face, -face, playing games with each other, certainly dating face-to-face, -face, and working face-to-face. -face. So although one had these technological inventions, they supplemented your real life. They didn't supplant your real life. And now, all those things, as you can see, can be 
um, substituted with a screen. So you can get up, you can go to work, you can go dating, you can go shopping, you can play games, all without meeting another human being. And how can this not, how can this not impact on how you see the world and how you interact with people, given we've seen how adaptable the human brain is? Um, this was highlighted a while ago in the Daily Telegraph when 200 of us signed a, uh, a letter, an open letter about the erosion of childhood. This is not about free lip gloss and eyeliner. It's more that it was the front page. And uh, you only have to compare pictures like this as well as with, with the Pope. Kids in the 1980s, whereas kids in the 2010s. And you can see a difference. Um, similarly, uh, I couldn't resist this picture of my, my friend's grandson, um, obviously having a lovely time just being outside and exercising and taking fresh air. And it put me in mind, anecdotally, of another um, email I had from a father in Australia. Last weekend, I had an eye-opening moment when the children had been lazing around the house, using and fighting over technology. When finally I was able to coerce them out for a short walk, we actually took bikes, and I watched them with delight, the laughter and fun the kids had riding up and down this particular steepish dog legs bend. The enjoyment, laughter, and giggles from one's children is truly music to the ears of a parent. I do not ever hear that laughter when they're using technology. And although that's not a peer-reviewed paper, I think sometimes a quote like that really just captures it. And then, just to add insult to injury, it turns out that the Silicon Valley Titans are not sending their children to conventional schools that have iPads, but guess what? They're sending them to schools that are technology-free. So I think that tells you something. And then this is another quote. Today, more than three billion people take a tiny supercomputer that has turned them, in the words of this guy, Michael Acton Smith, is the creator of this um, app, into dopamine-frazzled zombies. We're coming on to what dopamine is in a minute. And similarly, the founder, um, Tim Berners-Lee, um, the developer of the web, he said, humanity is connected now by technology. It's functioning in this serpian way. We have online abuse, prejudice, bias, polarization, fake news. There are lots of ways in which it is broken. He says we should have a Magna Carta for the web. That's his latest thing. Okay, so if we take all that together, as you've heard, I, I'm suggesting this is comparable to climate change. Um, but whereas climate change, I think, is damage limitation, the little I understand about it. Nonetheless, with mind change, it's in our hands to do something about it, hence this rather contrived image of hands. In both cases, it's unprecedented. In both cases, it's global, it's controversial, and it's multifaceted. And what I mean by that, it's not a simple problem. Are computers good or bad? Rather like with climate change, there's many sub-problems and issues to unpack. So it is with mind change, and hence this shameless plug for my book, which was published in 2014 which is sets out a less garbled way. Um, this is informatic on screen time, which I just thought I'd in include here. Um, in particular, the bottom right one, 73% of people believe the use of electronic devices has contributed to stress in their life. 81% of people admit to interrupting conversation mealtime or playing with family or friends to check their social media. Yeah, 61% of people have felt jealous, depressed, and sad or annoyed after checking updates. How can this be? helpful in the way we interact with each other. So let's now look in a little bit more detail at some of the issues that I'd like to flag very quickly. One is attention span, and this is peer-reviewed papers on attention span. Whenever you see the flash, these are peer-reviewed papers, and because of time, obviously, I don't have time to go into them, but I would commend them to you. It might come as no surprise that there is a shortening of attention span. Addiction, which is something that uh, clearly the parents are worried about, are, are screens addictive? Well, this is a very good review by Dr. Sigmund um, a year or so ago, which summarizes it, as you can see here. He's still talking about screen dependency disorders. Um, and again, um, from uh, the Herald Sun in Australia, um, a doctor uh, from McGill University, um, as well working with people at Monash, um, showing poor decision-making skills and volatile withdrawal symptoms were among the most common traits shared between groups, um, said the worrying trend. Social media use continues to grow with many individuals displaying anxious and even conflicted behaviours when attempting to withdraw. So I think people are now starting to acknowledge screen dependency as a genuine disorder, and indeed the World Health Organization have recently now uh, named it as a clinical disorder, internet gaming disorder. And we were talking just now about uh, how one would define that. And you can see here a list, which I won't rattle through with time, um, but uh, including withdrawal, tolerance, and all the features that we characterize clinically with addiction. OK, so how is it happening then? Well, this is, again, brain scans. And the yellow dots show areas of uh, microstructural abnormality from people with uh, internet addiction gaming. So we know the things that are changing. How is it happening? 
Okay, so again, The Telegraph, which is a very right-wing paper in the UK. I'm not a particular advocate of The Telegraph. It's just they do publish some good science stories sometimes. And this one was about children who love video games and have brains like gamblers. And what they drew attention to was this yellow blob at the center um, of the brain at the bottom, which was enlarged in kids who were playing video games a lot um, and resembled that scene also with gaming addiction. Now, it turns out that that area of the brain releases a chemical, which I've mentioned already, that you'll all have heard of, um, in excess. And this chemical underlies excitement, it underlies addiction. All drugs of addiction, irrespective of their target, will release this chemical, and it underlies reward. In case you haven't had one, that's a reward recently. Yeah, so biscuits, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, you've probably heard, it's called dopamine. Everyone's heard of dopamine. Now, what... Dopamine is a very hard-working transmitter, chemical messenger in the brain. It does lots of things, but I just want to draw attention to one particular action it has that underlies um, the issues we're looking at, and that's that it inhibits an important part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Now, this part of the brain is a very sophisticated part of the brain. It's biggest in us humans. We have 33% of our cortex is that, whereas only 70% of chimps. Now, what's really interesting is what happens when it is inhibited or damaged or under-functioning. You see a certain syndrome. And that syndrome was first described by someone called Harlow in the 1860s when someone called Phineas Gage actually had a terrible accident when he was tamping down explosive while laying a railway line, and it drove this rod through his prefrontal cortex, damaging it. And this is, there he is. Uh, sorry if this puts you off your breakfast. And then, anyway, so here is what Harlow said in 1868. He's fitful, irrelevant, indulging at times in profanity, manifesting little deference, impatient of restraint or advice. The crucial question is that here, he was a child in his intellectual capacity. Now, we know that the prefrontal cortex is only fully mature in late teenage years, early 20s. And in that sense, it's a good example of individual development reflecting evolution, what people used to rather pompously say, ontogeny reflects phylogeny. And that's an example of this. So this prefrontal cortex is very late to develop in any event. And you can see it here shown in turquoise. And I'd like to suggest that this gives us another feature that we should be studying, which is excessive recklessness. Because in children, as you can see here, it's only, as I mentioned, mature properly um, when you're in your early 20s. And here on the right, you can say that although intellectual ability sharply rises in early teen years, there's a great lag behind in what's called psychosocial maturity. That's to say attention spans um, and taking risks and so on. Now, there's another group of people also who have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex um, that display similar traits of recklessness. And they're shown here. Now, these people, people with high body mass index, and this is a peer-reviewed paper, have a less active prefrontal cortex. And similarly, people with a high body mass index um, are much more reckless in gambling tasks. Another group, this will all come together in a moment, bear with me, are schizophrenics, who again also have an underfunction prefrontal cortex. And schizophrenics, if you like, are like children. This is a very complex situation in schizophrenia, and obviously I just want to draw attention to the parallels with childhood, not go into all the nuances of schizophrenia. But the comparisons are that both are easily distracted, both have short attention spans, neither can interpret proverbs. If you say to a schizophrenic, what does it mean, people who live in glass houses mustn't throw stones, they'll say, if your house is made of glass and I throw a stone, your house will break, which is, of course, true, but it's that literal sense, rather like we saw with the computer about the steak and the vodka, that it's a failure to draw connections. Um, and both have underfunctioning prefrontal cortex. Now, what does this all have in common with gaming and high BMI and schizophrenia? Well, anyone who eats knows the consequence of eating, but the thrill of the food, for some, overrides the consequences you're going to pile on the calories. And anyone who gambles knows the consequence of gambling, but for many addictive gamblers, it is the roll of the roulette wheel, roll of the dice or the spin of the roulette wheel or the horse pass the finishing post that actually makes you very excited and that is what is addictive and compelling. And in schizophrenia, if you look at top left, everyone would recognize it as a cat. Bottom right, no one would recognize that as a cat. But that could be a clue. Could it be that in all these scenarios, rather as we see prompted by um, the paintings by the schizophrenic, that we've gone there from cognitive to sensory could it be that when you have excessive dopamine and or an underworking prefrontal cortex, that actually you are going back to having raw sensation? And that raw sensation overrides the consequences. It overrides the cognitive. Now, life has been ever thus with human beings. We've always liked wine, women, and song, drugs, and sex, and rock and roll. And in all those cases, 
you are abnegating a sense of self. What you do is you either take uh, alcohol or drugs that impair the connectivity of the chemical messengers between your connections so they're not working so well, or you put yourself in an environment that is stripped of cognitive content where actually you have raw sensation driving everything. Now, this was recognized by Euripides. This is um, from the Bacchae, which was written in about 500 BC, just after. And here you can see this poor king, Pentheus, in the middle, who's about to be torn apart by these wine-crazed women. Look at them. They're worshipping the wine god Dionysus. You can see how wine-crazed they look. So even then, it was acknowledged, and the play is all about the balance needed in life between the cognitive and the sensory, the prefrontal cortex working and it being underactive. Not that Euripides said that. But we do talk, do we not, about having a sensational time, if I said, oh, let's go out now and have a cognitive time, who's going to come? No one. Yeah, we're having, it's bad luck you're having a cognitive time now. Yeah. Um, and we talk about letting yourself go, blowing your mind, losing your mind. The word ecstasy comes from the Greek ecstasis, to stand outside of yourself. So although you're conscious, this carefully curated mind with its past, present, and future, these carefully curated connections, now they are no longer accessible. They're temporarily suspended in favor of the press of the moment, the thrill of the moment, as shown here. And indeed here, where from Australia, people wanted to be, um, they were paying money to be totally out of control. Okay. So we can think of two basic modes for the human brain. One is the meaningless, and the other is the meaningful, where the prefrontal cortex underfunctions as opposed to being active. Here, strong feelings versus thought. The sensory versus cognitive. Living in the here and now versus the past, the present, and the future. External stimuli driving your consciousness. So my little brother, for example, is much younger than me, who I used to torture mercilessly. When I knocked the ice cream out of his hand, you know, and he'd cry, you could just say, look at the birdie, and suddenly the tears would stop. Whereas if you have a tearful adult, you can't say, look at the birdie. They're not going to thank you for that. Um, so there you have this internal narrative that is so special to us. Here, the world has little meaning. Think of the wedding ring. Here, we have personalized meaning. Think of the wedding ring. Here, there is a reduced sense of self, and here, there is a strong sense of identity that I was saying is cultivated as we live our lives. Here, there is no time-space reference. If you have damaged the prefrontal cortex, you can have something called source amnesia, which means that you have generic memories, but not memories for particular episodes in time and space. Here, we have a clear time-space frame of reference, a narrative of past, present, future, beginning, middle and end. This is mainly infants and children. This is mainly adults. And kids uh, in the early teenage years have the biggest surge of dopamine they'll ever have, whereas we have less. So you can see that on the one hand, you've got excessive dopamine and in any way an immature prefrontal cortex. And those two together would give you the profile you're seeing on the left. So far, so good. But now with gaming, I think that balance is skewed. So here you have intense stimulation of the screen, which mandates a fast response. So you're very excited because you've got dopamine released. And that underlies reward-seeking behavior, which is addictive. That then inhibits the prefrontal cortex, bringing about scenarios such as childhood schizophrenia and obesity. And that is characterized for a drive for sensation rather than cognition. Where are you going to find that most? Where are you going to satisfy that drive? From the screen. And so round you go. And that, I suggest, is a model for addiction. OK, so they're moving on. Um, just to drill down now, and this is a very good paper by this one, Jean Twenge, who you may have heard of, which actually addresses the issue raised by many critics, which is what is the proof? And of course, in brain science, it's hard to tease out correlation from causality. But this is a very thorough study where she looked over time at different ages, and you can see here the amount of hours a day in screen use um, with different ages, how there's a deterioration for the longer the screen use has been going on, a direct correlation again here. So not remaining calm and not refinishing tasks, you can see there's a clear trend for all age groups that um, if they're using it for more than a few hours a day, that that is going to deteriorate. So that suggests there is a world now driven by external stimulation, a world where instead of your inner beginning, past, future, your identity, you are dependent on things coming from the outside world, the high arousal of the outside, probably the super stimulation that a screen provides. Now, a worrying indication of that trend comes from a paper published in the High Impact Journal Science recently, where they simply asked millennials um, to sit still for 10 to 15 minutes. A very cheap experiment, by the way. I just asked them to do that. And uh, this is what they found. So here we are. This is the, that's the reference. So in 11 studies, 
we found that participants typically did not enjoy spending 6 to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think. They enjoyed doing mundane activities much more, and this is the killer bit. Many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves instead of being left alone with their thoughts. So my case rests, yeah? Why would you want to do that? If you had a rich inner world, why would you want to do that? Most people seem to prefer doing something rather than nothing, even if the something is negative. So we see this kind of picture. One day I'm going to show this, and the guy's going to be a professor on the front row, I'm sure. But you see a world where there's no cognitive content, where you'll engage in activities characterized by strong stimulation rather than individual cognitive um, meaning, and where the time frame is much shorter, so you do not have time to develop your own thought, to join up the dots in your own way. Next thing is aggression. Um, and again, there's arguments about whether this um, encourages aggressive behavior. It's not so much that people go out and kill each other. It's not so much violence, but you do get an aggressive adversarial mindset. And you can see here that the brain, the reason is the brain is habituating to, um, to violent stimuli, as shown on the left, in a way that it's not on the right. Then we come on, perhaps most important of all for this um, for this conference to reduce interpersonal skills. Now, these gentlemen, um, even in a business context, are acting in a way that we would applaud. They're looking each other in the eye. They are touching each other. And probably the words are incidental. And indeed, we know that words have only 10% of total impact when you first meet someone. Eye contact, body language, voice, and pheromones, those sneaky chemicals that, um, you know, you say, oh, I just didn't get on with them. I don't know why. I just didn't hit it off. And physical contact, even here, even in a um, non-social scenario, all are really important for establishing interpersonal communication, and yet none are available on Facebook. Okay, so if you are not us, who had all those things already, but if you are a young person born in this century, when are you going to rehearse those other skills? When are you going to rehearse it? And you're only going to be good at what you rehearse. So, of course, it's going to be aversive because you won't be used to doing it, which means you'll carry on um, still doing the screen time communication. And you see this kind of thing all too often. This is not an advert for Pepsi, by the way. It's just that how often do we see this? These kids who are not talking to each other, who are not interacting with each other, not looking each other in the eye. Um, this has led somewhat controversially to people seeing parallels with autism. And, in fact, the phrase has been coined virtual autism, which is different. Virtual autism, as its name suggests, has been that if you spend a lot of time in front of a screen and you're very young, then you're not going to be very efficient at interpersonal skills. And that's shown here. There's some articles here. By the way, you're very welcome to this talk afterwards if you want it. I see people say, you're very, <laughs> please take those if you want, but you're, you're very welcome. I'm sure Mary will distribute the talk for anyone who wants it. You're very happy to have it. Now, the good news is it's reversible. The, I repeat, the good news is it's reversible. And what uh, this study did in uh, the journal Computers in Human Behavior is they actually took a group of preteens and uh, for half of them confiscated their mobile devices and sent them to summer camp for five days, just five days. And they found that, guess what? Are we surprised that the kids that were in summer camp for five days already had significant improvement in their um, nonverbal emotional cues and in their empathy and their interaction? And we're not surprised, are we, at this? I mean, perhaps what's surprising, it only took five days to achieve. So that leads on, then, to identity. And I think that's really of the essence of what we've been talking about. And what I fear is that we're going to now have a fragile identity. Um, if people are constantly downloading and sharing and are dependent on external input rather than having a rich inner world, what is that going to say about how they see themselves? And what will that lead to? Just look at this history of blogging. I quite like this. Um, so it went back to 99. I have to tell something, someone about this thing my cat did today. 2004, oh my God, cat pictures. YouTube, you know what's coming, obviously. Um, 2005, moving cat pictures, and then that pinnacle of civilization, so beloved south of the border by the head of state. Um, 2007, 1pm, uh, my cat just sneezed. 102, cat sneezed again. 104, uh, cat sneezed. He's recently getting worried. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> My hope is these people, are in, they're in existential crisis. You know, why, why do you need constant feedback? You know? um, I mean, I work with a lot of millennials, people in their 20s, and they're always taking photos of their breakfast or their food or their, you know, the most boring things. Is it, why should anyone be? And what does it say? Does that mean you're insecure in who you are? You need feedback. Yes, that's exciting. Oh, that's good. My breakfast was the same as your breakfast. My breakfast is better. Yeah. What, why? I, you know, it's, it just seems a very strange very strange pattern and something we should think about. So this something about social networking, what is it 
Um, okay, so let's think about that. No one likes to be lonely. None of us like loneliness. Okay, so um, it's bad for your health. We know that it compromises the immune system if you're lonely. And so what we love to do is share personal information. It makes us feel good. It's in evolutionary reasons for doing that, otherwise we'd never procreate. Of course, it makes you feel good. And there's a lovely study, I think it was Harvard, where, um, but it's in my book, Mind Change, it's referenced there, but it's a proper study, where they gave subjects who had done well the opportunity either to have monetary reward for their task, or the alternative was actually, slightly strange, it was the opportunity to talk about themselves. And most of them chose to talk about themselves rather than take money. Yeah. So, as I say, next time someone comes to you for a pay rise, say, well, sorry, no dice, but you can talk about yourself half an hour, <laughs> and hopefully that'll do it for you. you know? so, okay. So, um, social, social networking sites, we know release dopamine, which we've seen, makes you feel good. But this time, there is no... Now, this is a really important point. Body language is there for a reason. It's the handbrake that nature puts on against to offset the natural tendency we have to talk about ourselves. So, in normal interpersonal relationship... You won't confide in someone, you won't obey your desire to talk about yourself if they're shaking their head, their arms are folded, they're averting their eyes and they're leaning away from you. you that will be the handbrake. Similarly, um, they might get bored of you talking about yourself on and on, they'll want to say something as well, so that offsets things as well. So in face-to-face -face interaction, um, you can see how one can offset, the nat contain the natural desire we have to talk about ourselves by protecting you at the same time from being trading off your privacy and being vulnerable to bullying. And what happens there, and sadly we know that's on the increase, is in retaliation what people do is conflate an artificial sense of who they are. They will fabricate a new life that's not the real you at all. So this, of course, will appease your audience of 500 so-called friends. They're not really friends, they're really an audience. Um, and that, hopefully, will get you all these friends and all this approval, but the real you will be lonely. The real you is atrophying. So who is this real you? Yeah, and I think that that is another danger that we are facing when we're thinking about um, social networking. So you can see here, this is recently, this is really depressing. It came out in the UK last year. A fifth of young people disagree with the statements that they find life really worth living. I mean, what a terrible indictment. Yeah? Uh, and there we are. 18%. Um, and then up to 60%, I find it difficult not to compare my life to others. 57%. Social media creates an overwhelming pressure to succeed. I feel more anxious about my future when seeing the lives of friends online, 48%. And those of us who grew up without social media would never have made statements like that because it would have been impossible. And many say that it is indeed bad for the health. This is people from Facebook. Um, so this guy, um, Chamath Palit, I can't pronounce his name, but uh, he actually worked for Facebook and he said quite, I think, Articulately, the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops are creating a destroying how society works. And then Sean Parker, who was a founder of Facebook, uh, it literally changes your relationship with society with each other. It probably interferes with productivity and workways. God knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Now, if people that work for Facebook are saying that, should we not be concerned? Okay, this is a study done a while ago now by the British government. And it, for those people that like um, pie charts and histograms, it bristles with... Um, are lots of statistics about the decline in identity, partly attributable to the um, increase in relation. You can download it um, uh, from the screen. So what do we do about identity? and how, What do we know about identity and how we can uh, help people have a secure sense of who they are? Well, we love to um, be assured that we have a particular identity. Uh, we like to impress it on others. And this goes back a long time to the nephew of Freud, a guy called Bernays, who was in advertising in the 1920s, as you can see from the picture. Um, and he was tasked with getting young women to smoke in an era when they didn't, and in a time when people didn't realize the perils of smoking. Um, and so what he did to persuade young women to smoke was get attractive young women to be seen holding cigarettes. And he didn't just say, oh, smoking's nice or something. No, he said, this is the torch of freedom. It will stand for something. It will say something about you. It will say something about you. Now, that's something that advertising has really hooked onto. Some of you may remember Betty Crocker cakes. I'm sure they were here as they were in the UK. They weren't selling very well, the instant cake mix, until they came up with the genius idea that they would ask the person themselves, the user, to add their own egg. And by adding an egg, you were adding your individuality. I know, it's sad, isn't it? But no, but it's true. It's true. People felt they were expressing themselves by adding an egg. 
Yeah? It, no, don't, I know it's funny. But, um, so we know that there's always been an appeal for products that say something about your help, your express your individuality in that way. Um, and if you Google the slogan, as individual as you are, all manner of things come up. Look at this. All these things will make you more individual, in case you wondered. Yeah? Um, the problem is that you find that you have a kitchen or whatever, and then your neighbor has, they're more individual, and you have this arms race you know, for individuality. So it's not really a very good strategy for becoming an individual is by buying things. Um, a more uh, recent strategy, and I don't know, I hope I don't offend anyone in this room, um, but it does fascinate me, which is the rise and rise of tattoos. Um, now, tattoos have been around forever, and yet only in the last, what, five or 10 years have they become mainstream. Now, why is that? What does that tell us? Could it be that in a world that is highly transient, where everything is shared, where you have no clear boundary, no clear sense of who you are, because every thought, every moment is tweeted or photographed or shared, a tattoo, a tattoo is permanent by definition, and it's on your skin, and therefore it's yours. And that, uh, echoing that notion is this quote from this woman, Zara Barr, my tattoos remind me of who I am when I start to feel my identity getting blurred in the thick of life. How many people here would say they get their, I know who I am? And I'm sure you do. You don't need tattoos to remind you who you are. They root me when I start to lose myself. They're about memorializing something so important it has to be engraved on my skin. And similarly, Johnny Depp. My body is my, my tattoos are my story. Notice story. So I think this is a really interesting trend, and I'll just leave it as interesting without a value judgment, that people um, feel that they need to embrace something that is permanent in this way. Does that say something about how they are seen and how they perceive themselves in the real world. What could we do about it? Well, I think a better way of having an identity rather than adding an egg to a cake mix or lighting up a cigarette or having a tattoo is this, when you're a kid, is to develop a real inner narrative of which I've been talking. And do you remember when you're a child, do you remember that exciting invitation? Let's make up a game. Let's make up a game. And this box is a castle. No, it's not. It's a rocket. No, it's not. It's a racing car. Do you remember that excitement of anything was possible? And with minimal props, you could go outside and a stick would be a sword and, a, uh, and if you needed anything at all. And why that is so important, in my view, is that what you're rehearsing, there's a life story. It's a story. Things happen. There's a narrative. Yeah? You have a beginning, a middle, and end to your little game that you're playing. And what it's doing is actually giving you a strong inner narrative that's perhaps prompted by things like a box from the outside, but it's not driven by it. Whereas if you compare that with these poor little kids sitting in front of a screen driven by someone else's imagination where they're given fixed menus and options, where all they can do is, um, uh, with their fingers, uh, manipulate it, skim things through. What a difference from having a world where anything, where you can be in a spaceship, you can be in a car, and it can suddenly change, and you can be anything you want to be, and you're rehearsing a story, and, but you're in control. It's coming from you. It's coming from inside. Would that not give you a strong sense of confidence and identity that sadly is at jeopardy now by someone constantly being on the receiving end of um, sensory stimulation all the time. Echoing that idea, this is another one, is pro critical thought. These are from two veteran school teachers um, on the right, uh, Matt Miles and Joe Clement, who are based in Washington, DC. I would urge you to read this book, which I've endorsed on the front. Um, they, like lots of teachers, have had the benefit of looking at different generations and how um, things are changing. And they actually contacted me because they were so concerned. You yourselves might like to hook up with them. They would love it because they feel that they're fighting a losing battle against a government that imposes iPads in classrooms and so on. Um, they are really great guys. They've been teaching for several decades, and they've just written this book, which I'd endorse you to hook up with them. And on the left, you can see from Davos to just the spread of information is like a digital wildfire. But as we've seen, information is not knowledge. And if you say, well, if you say, well, what is honor? If you Google honor, very nuanced and subtle thing. Uh, if you do it in the UK, the queen comes up immediately, of course. But then you get these other. Now, if you showed this to a Martian or a small child, would they understand what honor was? No, they wouldn't. Um, it's a bit like also um, when you go straight on the screen and you compare, say, this video princess with Princess Maria in War and Peace. They're both fictional princesses, but I bet you feel differently about them. I bet you don't care about the princess in the video game, but you do care about Princess Maria, otherwise you wouldn't be turning the pages of the book. And so they're both fictional, but why do you care more about Princess Maria? It's because she's like you. She's got a life story like you. She has relationships like you. And by having association, she therefore has a significance and a meaning, think of the wedding ring, like you. 
And therefore, you keep turning the pages because it's a beginning, a middle, and an end in the future. It's a life story. Whereas the princess in the video game is literally meaningless. She's just there. She doesn't have any connections. There's someone who agrees here. I worry that the sort of overwhelming rapidity of information is in fact affecting cognition. It's affecting deeper thinking. I still believe sitting down and reading a book is the best way to learn something. And this person says he's worried we're losing that. And this is the person. And he's the chairman of Google, or was. So if the chairman of Google is concerned about this, then surely um, we are legitimate in our concerns also. Um, while we're looking at quotes, if you go back 50 years even, the writer Isaac Asimov was very prescient. Back in 1964, he predicted what life would be like in 2014. Look what he said. It's really good. So he was predicting life. He said, even so, mankind will suffer badly from the disease of boredom. The lucky few who can be involved in creative work of any sort will be the true elite of mankind. Let's get this. For they alone will do more than serve the machine. And he said that 50 years ago. So what kind of mindset are we looking at of the future? Well, we've seen a short attention span, sensation at a premium, addictive personality, recklessness, low on empathy, poor interpersonal skills, a weak sense of identity, perhaps good at information processing, but looking at icons, not abstract ideas, and therefore poor critical thought. So instead of being like a computer, as some people feel, I don't think we're going to be like computers this next generation, but perhaps worse, like volatile three-year-olds, permanently stuck in a world where they have this weak sense of identity, um, everything is self-referential, uh, poor communication skills, and highly needy. Um, how can we combat that? OK, so I think if you accept my premise that we need to help people escape from the press of the moment and from the impact of raw senses and give them back something cognitive, surely what we need to start to do is to generate an individual life story and to remind them of their life story. So as we've seen, you're living in the present, but you have a past and a future. So you need to span both the past and the future by being aware, as I say, of an extended present, not just of the present. Now, how can you do that? Well, we know the brain adapts to things, and uh, that's why multitasking, which some people applaud, I think, as you can see here on the right, is actually really poor for the brain. What we need to do is, instead of having simultaneous things, we need to have things that impose a sequence, that have that linearity, that give you the time frame. Now, one example is playing music. And this is a lovely study um, by three groups of adult human volunteers, none of whom can play the piano. If you ever get the chance to volunteer for a study like this, um, a word of advice, try and not be in the control group because they stared at a piano for five days. Yeah. And uh, this is what happened. You can see on the left to right, this blob, um, there's a, the brain is literally unimpressed. Nothing's happened. But if you compare that with the second group who actually were taught five-finger piano exercises, you can see here that there's an astonishing change in the activation of the brain territory even after five days. This is an example, again, of plasticity, a bit like with the juggling. But the most exciting group was the third group and these people were merely asked to imagine they were playing the piano. OK? And look at them. So what does that tell you? It tells us, as far as the brain is concerned, it's not the actual contraction of the muscle. It's the thought that precedes it. I'll repeat, it's the thought that precedes it, which makes us then come back to reflecting on what is a thought, different from an emotion. When you have an emotion, you scream, you cry, you laugh, as a baby will do, as animals do. But a thought is not necessarily... Um, seen in very small children and animals in the way it is with us. What's the difference? When you have a thought, you end up in a different place than where you started. Whether it's a memory or a hope or a fear or a lie, it doesn't really matter, a logical argument, you've ended up in a different place. And how did you get to that different place? By a sequence of steps. And the man who developed the treatment for Parkinson's came up with this lovely quote of, of thinking. He said, it's movement confined to the brain. OK? So thinking is movement confined to the brain. Now, in order to have these sequence of steps, you need a time frame, because it takes time to go from one to the other. And that's what I think the sequence is enabling you to do. So anything with a sequence is enforcing the thought process. So let's have a think about that, as it were. So if you accept either a logical argument or business, but this is Baba Yaga, the wicked Russian witch. Um, so when I was in my kindergarten, the, the teacher read these stories. She had metal teeth and ate the heads off children. And I used to plague my little brother with stories of Baba Yaga. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see him in tears, very gratifyingly. Was, uh, uh, so that's not a thing to say to people in empathy, sorry. Uh, and it, he's got his own stories to tell of this. But nonetheless, I still remember the stories of Baba Yaga. So stories actually enforce thought because the whole thing 
the feature, the common feature, is a sentence or a story or a life story is the same as a thought, which it all has a sequence going in one direction, as does sport. So physical exercise we know is good for you um, because you can see here actually encourages something called neurogenesis, which is the production of new neurons. And again, a quote from Nietzsche from a long time ago, all truly great thoughts are conceived while walking. Now, we know that exercise is good, but perhaps here you haven't realized, even in the adult, physical activity, you can see here's one of the drivers shown in um, green here, as offsetting stress and aging for encouraging the production of neurons. Similarly, in school-aged children, we know that physical activity is correlated positively with academic performance, as you can see here, both mathematical development and reading development is, in, is positively correlated with aerobic capacity of more oxygen going. And then for those of us who are older, even we don't get off the hook, you can see here exercise training, you look at the ability it has to enhance our cognitive skills, even as we're older. So it's a no-brainer, really, to talk about how obviously good sport is and physical activity is. But there's other activities as well that I think impose rigid sequences. One is cooking. You can't hurry a roast dinner. Um, you can't reverse the order in which you um, proceed with a recipe. You are forced to wait for periods of time, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You can't reverse or jumble up the order. Similarly with eating, you don't reverse or jumble up the order. Traditionally, you start, guess what, with the starter, end up with the pudding. And when you eat, that's when you are actually interacting in the way that all anthropologists have acknowledged the very word copain with bread, companiaras, companion, um, by its sharing a table with her, that's where it's much more than ingesting calories. You are actually acting out a sequence. And similarly, on a longer scale, gardening, you, don't, you can't reverse the order in which a plant grows. And you have to wait certain times. Now, all these things might seem obvious, but my own view is that these are very important parts of being human, and we neglect them at our peril. We know while we're on gardening that physical... Um, interaction with nature. This was comparing people in um, Ann Arbor uh, with downtown Michigan, and they found that that enhanced their cognitive skills when they were all scoring the same. Half went to um, Ann Arbor Arboretum, and the other went to downtown, and the ones that were in the Arboretum benefited. Now, people have hooked onto that. I bet you can't guess what this is. It's actually Microsoft's new offices. Yeah? I've realized it's, uh, the benefits of being outside. Um, and finally, the obvious example of sequencing action is, um, is reading. This is another shameless plug, this time for my mum. This is available on Amazon, and she was a dancer, as you can see, and that's her on the, on the right. Um, she calls herself Doris, that was her stage name. Her real name's Doris, which is a bit workaday, but she thought Doris sounded fancier, so there she is. So she's Doris. Um, and there she is. She's changed a bit now. She's 92. But um, she wrote this when she was 89, 90, and I applaud her for that. But the whole point is that reading provides a temporal framework. It gives you a meaning. And we've seen meaning comes from joining up the dots. It enhances your attention span. And you know when you read a book, the characters are so real, which is why I always say the book is better than the film. Always. You always say that. Now, why is that? It's because your imagination is something very special. And it's something that doesn't come when you're very little, but it only comes by rehearsal of being read to and reading um, that you develop that rich inner world, which is what I'm plugging. It's that rich inner world that is both your sanctuary and your identity, and that, I feel, is endangered by the current lifestyle. Um, and this lovely quote, imagination should be used not to escape reality, but to create it. Isn't that nice? Um, and it provides the temporal sequence thinking, which we've seen is movement confined to the brain. So the takeaways, then, would be, for doing this, Physical exercise, interaction with nature, cooking, eating together, gardening, music, stories. Now, these things are not expensive or you know, bizarre activities. They're very straightforward things that I feel should be counterbalanced with um, the digital activities that, of course, we all do. There's this lovely quote from Bang McIntyre about stories. From the moment we become aware of others, we demand to be told stories that allow us to make sense of the world, to inhabit the mind of someone else. In old age, we tell stories to make small museums of memory. It matters not whether the stories are true or imaginary. The narrative, whether oral or written, is a staple of every culture the world over. But stories demand time and concentration, notice time. The narrative does not simply transmit information, but invites the reader or listener to witness the unfolding of events. And I thought of particular elements here. You inhabit the mind of someone else. That's what reading does and helps establish empathy. So a vision for the 21st century, then, would be that, first of all, um, we need to put a premium on... Um, identity, not on how many Facebook friends you've had, not on your tattoos, but on your private inner world that is curated by you, and you alone. 
you respect and have, therefore, individuality. That's the most important thing. And by promoting individuality, you will then promote empathy, which is what we are, after all, gathered in this room to discuss. And you're very welcome to this talk. Um, if, on reflection, you want to talk to me, then these are my emails. Um, the first one is the general one. The second is on our work on Alzheimer's, if you're interested. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.